morning and welcome to the RTC Tuesday, March 19th regular meeting. Uh, it is 8.30 and our meeting is now in order. Uh, while waiting for a quorum, uh, we'll first open the floor to public comment. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised online or in the in the room. I think we're okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll close the period for public comment. And if there's no objection, we'll skip to the first discussion item, which is the Colorado Freight Plan. Of Cole Nieder, Senior Transit Planner, presenting today. See Craig Hurst. Hello. Hello everyone, my name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's transit planner. I uh, work on maintaining and updating our current freight plan and I also participated in the uh, statewide uh, freight plan planning efforts on behalf of Dr. Cog. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So over the past year, the CDOT Freight Mobility and Safety Branch has been conducting workshops, research and outreach to update the Colorado freight plan. And they will be presenting a very high level um, kind of introduction on that today with some key priorities drawn from that plan and how they align with state and federal goals and how they conduct their overall planning process. Um, this update is timely as we at Dr. Cog um, are also beginning the process of updating our regional freight plan. So keep that in mind during this presentation on different things you'd like to see in our own uh, regional multimodal freight plan. Uh, see, that's the standard of freight uh, planning in our state, and it's great to hear from them today. So I'll turn it over to Craig and Erica. Good morning, and thank you for having us. My name is Craig Hurst. I'm CDOT's Freight Mobility and Safety Branch Manager. Um, until last December, was on Dr. Cog with you guys, so I do know some of you. Um, so. As Cole said, we have spent the last year, actually quite a bit more than that, um, working on CDOT's freight plan. Uh, so it's a statewide freight plan. We really use federally, uh, federal data that's available to us to answer 17 key areas um, that the Federal Highway Administration is uh, requiring of all states. And then we go ahead and um, add a bunch of perspective from CDOT in Colorado. Um, so Erica, uh, is the freight planner at CDOT. Um, I'll let her introduce herself, but she's been working with me for about, for about the entirety of the plan. I hired her right as we were starting, so she got to dive right in. But uh, her family owns Denny Transport, and so she knows the trucking business really well um, and is in Commerce City um, like I always was. But we're here to talk to you about at probably the 80,000-foot view of what the freight plan is. Just to give you perspective, it's 350 plus pages um, with over 110 pages of economic analysis in it. And so it's kind of boring um, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, but but uh, to, you know, there's also some very exciting parts and we'd like to highlight that for you uh, this morning. Go ahead, Erica. Okay, it's not boring if you like economic percentages and values like I do, but maybe I'm just a nerd. Call me crazy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Denny. As Craig stated, I am the Colorado Freight Planner within the Freight Mobility and Safety Branch. I've been at CDOT just about a year now. As of April, it will be one year. And as he stated, I come from the transportation industry. I'm not a planning background individual, so I'm trial by fire, learning every single day how the planning perspective goes. But I do understand freight and the movement through our state, having grown up with my family business. So I'm just going to dive right in. Forewarning, I've got a lot of stuff I'm going to throw at you, so I'm going to talk pretty fast. If I'm going too fast, if you want me to go into more detail about anything, please let me know, or we can discuss at the end of the presentation. Maybe. There we go. Okay. We're going to dive in with the freight plan purpose really quickly. Um, Craig mentioned a little bit about what the federal requirements are, the 17 key items. So. What we have to do is try and craft this, this policy document. This is not a project plan, so please understand we do not have projects listed out throughout the plan of what we're going to do over the next four years. 
These um, freight plans are in for four years, but it's more of a policy document talking about more of the kind of high level, how we might try and approach different topics and different issues versus specific projects. So what we have to do is create our priorities and our priorities naturally start with what the feds require because we do need them to approve in order to get this grant funding in the first place. But we also want to overlap the CDOT goals and priorities as well as within our own department within CDOT and the freight branch. So we take a data-driven approach along with a lot of stakeholder input to try and put this together. This is kind of a visual uh, of the high level of the freight branch goals, so within ourselves, the national freight goals based on the feds, and the Colorado CDOT wildly important or WIG goals uh, labeled below. So we've kind of put them into different buckets that we visualize within our own group as in safety, security, mobility, maintenance, economic vitality, and sustainability and resiliency. So I'm going to go over a high level of those and what we're kind of looking at throughout the plan to try and put it all together. We've spent the last year doing as much as we possibly can in getting in front of stakeholders. We're very appreciative of people like Cole joining in and giving their input, asking questions, et cetera, because that's what we have to do to understand what different parts of the state really need. We were able to go out into the public and do all sorts of in-person events, especially throughout the summer, trying to get in, you know, in front of as many individuals as we can to get their concept of what we need within the state for freight. We were able to do different surveys, hand out comment cards, fun fact sheets, et cetera, and really had some very interesting conversations with the general public. We also have been working very closely with our Freight Advisory Council from an industry perspective as well as the Colorado Motor Carriers, CWPMA, et cetera, association-wise. We also went to different businesses that have a large supply chain network within the state to conduct interviews to try and help get a better idea of what they need and what they see within our state. We also worked within our regions and agency partnerships, such as Dr. Cog, to try and make sure that we're trying to overlap as much as your needs as we can within a state freight plan. Some of the successes, we had over 100 different conversations with people face-to-face -face throughout the state, which, given that we did all of this in a year, we found to be pretty successful. Uh, our survey hit over 380 individuals. We had quite a few respondents, which was great. We had it in both English and in Spanish to try and be as inclusive as we possibly could. A lot of the different events that we went to, including the Sheridan um, event here within Dr. Cog, there's a lot of just disproportionately impacted communities, sorry, that's a hard word for me, um, that we want to make sure that we can also tap into because they are a critical piece of our state. This is just a visual of where we had our surveys come in, which we found to be a great success. We can't just focus on one part of the state. We have to look across all four corners, and we were able to successfully have participants from all four corners and then some send things in uh, to get their perspective. So now I'm going to go into those kind of high-level goals that we had put for priorities within the freight branch that had the national and the state goals below them. This is zoomed into the Dr. Cog region. This is just a, an example of some of the data that we were able to look at, and this is the crash rate per vehicle mile traveled for trucks. So again, this is very zoomed in uh, just on this region. The orange is above 30 incidences over the last from 2017 to 2021, blue is 15 to 30, green is 5 to 15, and then the grays and blanks are 5 or less. This is a visual of the different safety operations um, assets that we have within the freight, uh, freight sector of the state. So you've got your chain stations, which are the green X's. You've got your runaway truck ramps, which are the kind of purple diamonds. You've got the weigh-in motions, which are in the blue, and pull-outs, which are in orange. This is another example of some of the data in the um, at-grade crossing in incidences. Naturally, any time you can have a vehicle and a train interact, you're going to have an unfortunate impact on occasion. People make mistakes. No matter what we try and do, I have a feeling that will probably still be a potential uh, threat, and this shows the incidence locations that are more prevalent. So what are some of our strategies? I don't know if any of you have seen the Mountain Rules campaign. That's a safety campaign that came out starting in 2019. And we've done what I find personally to be a pretty good job of trying to get education out there for truck drivers 
specifically truck drivers that are not from the state of Colorado. We've created these videos from a government perspective, so we can't tell them how to drive a truck because that's not our place. But just to give them an overview of, hey, if you're coming into Colorado and you're going through I-70, be prepared. Have food, have the accurate clothing, have chains, have this, have that. Know that once you get up over you know, the Eisenhower-Johnson Tunnel, you've got a whole other pass to get up over to get through Vail before you enter the western side of our state. So know where you're going, understand what's ahead, don't speed, don't try and make up time going down the hill, your brakes are going to burn out, here's where the runaway truck ramps are, please use them, stuff like that. So we're trying to get in front of them so that they have a better idea um, before coming into our state because until you go through it, you really don't know what's coming. So that's a, just one of the many examples of some of the stuff we're looking at safety-wise. Truck parking is a big important issue for us in trying to figure out how we can better utilize the assets that we already have and potentially open up opportunities for instances like last week where we have a crisis. Where do we put our trucks? Can we try and have some type of partnership with different areas to be able to utilize large parking areas for trucks? Mobility, again, back to kind of the data perspective. Um, this bottleneck image is more of the entire state, not just Dr. Cog region, but gives you kind of an idea of where some of the challenges are. As of last month, um, ATRI, American Transportation Research Institute, which they primarily look within the transportation of trucks side, uh, they came out and said that Colorado does have a few of the top 100 bottlenecks within, within the country. So naturally a big effort for us of how do we try and help resolve that, help fix that, reduce the congestion, which leads to fewer emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So big impact. And it, economically, you can see the cost of congestion per day. It's huge. And, you know, you've got a lot of food and agriculture moving throughout this state, and that takes the biggest hit as far as the financial burden on transportation taking, uh, taking longer than needed because of bottlenecks and congestion. So some of the strategies that we're looking at, um, you know, you can see there's a high-level list right here. And, again, if you look through the actual document, you'll have quite a bit to read into. Um, but we even worked with the military recently trying to work on their PPP routes, getting out of Fort Carson, should we have to go to a time of war, how do they deploy if they can't utilize just trains? So that's something that we worked on very recently on how they route through our state, what can manage you know, the weight of some of those tanks going over some of these bridges, what ways won't work, probably more importantly. Uh, so constantly working at different things like that. Maintenance, um, you know, big thing within our department is the permits operations, so for oversized, overweight, um, and hazmat. So bridges and vertical clearance is something that our team looks at every single day. Last night was an unfortunate instance of someone who didn't follow the rules and did not come to our program to try and get a permit. Um, so something <laughs> that, you know, we try and control as much as we possibly can, naturally. And drivability life on the right-hand side, again, that's more of the statewide uh, visual of where we're at as far as the pavement. Maintenance strategies, one of the wins we've had recently over the last couple of years, and we will continue to do so, is a timber bridge replacement program. So back to the oversized overweight permitting, if there's a way that we can cut out a number of miles on an overweight truck just by helping reinforce a bridge, instead of having to completely rebuild it, waiting for it to fail, we can go in and we found that we can put in additional girders underneath to help strengthen and lengthen the life cycle of that bridge, which then allows these trucks to go over it. We don't have to worry about it as much as far as maintaining and replacing so quickly. So it's been a huge win at really a pretty low cost. So we're trying to get creative in ways to try and help be more efficient, but also drive value within what our taxpayer dollars are going towards. Economic vitality. This is just the Dr. Cobb region. Very, this is where I get interested. Some people might glaze over in the economic session, but I think this is really interesting. You know, Colorado is a state, within transportation, we all know Colorado is a consumer, consumer market. I call it consumer town, but it's a consumer market. There's way less going out than coming in, or going, coming in than going out, excuse me. And just in the Dr. Cog region, you've got 136 point, $130.6 billion worth of goods coming in and 81.6 going out. So you can see the discrepancy just within this region as far as the dollars coming in and out. Um, some of the strategies we're looking at when it comes to this, I think a lot of you have probably heard about the truck driver shortage. Not new, it's been around since before I was born. Uh, it's just kind of the reality of, of 
the world. People don't really want to sit in a truck and drive it for a living. Um, there's been a lot of successes in that they get paid quite a bit more. There's a lot uh, more regionalized networking that they can do at this point for different companies. But here within CDOT, within the freight branch, was the first ever apprenticeship program put together by the department to try and help promote and get people in the door to become a CDL holder and a truck driver. It was something that the uh, freight branch worked on before I was a part of it, but I was a stakeholder, so to say, at that time, um, to try and figure out how do we try and get in front of people who may not know where to go with their career, who might be in a tough spot, and don't realize that driving a truck can make a great living for you and your family. So that was something that was a huge success, and that was the Colorado Delivers program. We hope to try and continue to find efforts like that that we can utilize and then hand off. We handed it off to Adams County, who's taking it on and continuing it into the future. We're also trying to look at different modes. How do you make it most efficient between modes? You've got new huge rail complexes coming in up north and then out east of, of the Denver metro, and how do we try and make that efficient between that and trucking and everything else? Sustainability, um, you know, this are, these are a few of the other things we had to look at as naturally within the state, but also the Fed requirement. One of the interesting things is the wild animal involved truck related crash. On the right hand side, that may look like a lot, but in all reality, that's pretty darn good. The state of Colorado has done a fantastic job over a number of years making it a priority to try and help mitigate the impact of those types of collisions. So, um, props to Colorado. Some of the strategies, um, and you can just kind of see some of them listed out, and sorry, I'm talking long, so I'm just kind of just going to jump through here. So Freight Investment Plan, or FIP, that's why we're doing all of this in the first place. National Highway Freight Program is where we get the funding. By having a approved freight plan by the federal government, we get National Highway Freight Program dollars. We get X amount every year. Uh, it's a little bit different for each state, and it's kind of a little bit different for each year for each state as far as how much that we can receive. But you can see since the birth of the NHSP program, we've had $179 million invested into the state of Colorado. And that will just continue to grow as we move forward. So we've been through all of these different emphasis areas that we've been focusing on, and we've kind of clumped it into three major goal areas, truck safety, freight operations, and clean transportation. Everything that we want to do with this plan hits those three markers. Truck safety, naturally, we want everybody to get home to their families every single day, even if it's not maybe that night, the truck driver that gets there four days later, we want them safe to their family, we want them safe to their delivery, to their pickup, et cetera. Uh, freight operations, how do we try and help make it efficient for these trucks to be able to get through our state safely? How do we make it so that they have a place to go for a safe haven, et cetera? Clean transportation, how do we help the energy department to push forward into new technologies such as electric, but also how do we find those small wins that are more of today uh, possibility? We've got a long way to go for the grid to be able to get a truck that's electric to move around our state. How do we get a win today? Example would be the timber bridge that I noted earlier. Next steps, um, this is a little bit, well, not necessarily dated, but new exciting news as of last week, FHWA approved our 2024 plan. So that is officially in motion and we have it for the next four years. So all of this work did come in and um, they didn't have any issues. So we're pretty proud of that and pretty excited. So we've already started our next call for projects. We're working with the regions right now who are working on applications and we're hoping to get this moving forward so that we can start giving out money towards projects here within the next couple of months. With that, that was a lot. Are there any questions? Thank you, nice presentation. And are there questions for Erica or Craig? Yes, Director Cook. Is it on? Okay. Um, so uh, the slide that showed uh, the, the accident rate um, included, it looked like Colfax through Denver. Is that local um, deliveries? And do we know how BRT will affect that? So the data that we're able to, huh? Well, we, we, we do cover several highways, as we all know, through, through the major parts of town. 
And so, yeah, all of those incident rates are for every statewide route. And so if it's a highway, we do have the data on it. And one of the key things to share with, with you all is that we're working with our consultant. When we purchase the data that we have to use for these plans, one of the, one of the main data sources that we do is with the, through a company called TransSearch. And their contracting uh, practices are we can't share like the data set, but they never said we can't put it on a GIS map and make it shareable that way. So we're working hard at getting this available to at several different layers. So crash rates, um, economic impacts, things like that. We're gonna try to have, we're, we're developing a tool that we can share with everybody to help out with local and municipal uh, planning. You know, freight planning has always been around, but never at the level that we have now. Uh, our, our branch uh, was put in to place in Senate Bill 2260. So we really got um, set up as we are today in 2021. Uh, before that, I was managing the freight office, but it was kind of like uh, no real boss, you know, uh, kind of a handshake agreement. So a lot of what you're seeing here is our first go at this, and we're really going to um, be able to get deeper into depth with you guys as we continue to talk. You know, we, um, like we said, we spent a year getting this done, and it's quite, quite a bit and uh, was intensive work, but it's a foundation, and I think the answer is that we all want, um, we'll take more information, you know, m deeper dives into all of this. We've had a pretty rough two weeks uh, if you're sitting in my seat because uh, the storm. Um, we do our very best, just to give you guys uh, an idea of what we're doing there new is we have the capability to communicate the trucks inside their cab now. So through the electronic logging device, so what we did is I started telling people while they were still in Utah that I-70 was closed, uh, while they were still in Nebraska, while they were still in Kansas. So you can make that decision to use I-80 or to um, park and find a safe place there or to move south and take 40. Um, all of that costs a lot of money for a truck driver. Uh, you know, think about all the additional miles that you're doing. So it's a big decision for them and their dispatchers or um, – but a lot of times, you know, when we're, when we're trying to work through a lot of this, the hardest people to get to is, is the people that just travel through our state three or four times in their career, maybe. Um, and, and so, as Erica was talking about, we have the Mountain Rules Truck Safety Program. And to come back to I-70 and the crashes that you see here highlighted in orange, it looks red on the screen. Just She said orange. It definitely looks orange here, but it's red um, on the screen. That red line down the center is 70 um, and we're going to continue to try to make improvements there because um, those crashes are runaway trucks. 92% of runaway trucks on I-70 are from a CDL holder from out of state. And, you know, there's some built-in challenges that we're constantly working on. But, you know, I used to teach CDL classes in Nevada, and we'd spend three days on mountain driving in, in the uh, three-week course. You go to Florida – and they might spend 15 minutes because they don't have mountains there, and they both comply with the federal training um, program. And so how can we get people who are, you know, they are, they are, class, they are trained uh, appropriately, but when they get here, they're not trained at all. They don't have that perspective. You can't recreate the Rocky Mountains anywhere except here. And so um, we're, when we're talking about strategies here, I think there's um, – this is a high level we can dive really deep in, and I'm really excited to work with um, Cole on the, the Dr. Cog freight plan. We just, we just helped Pikes Peak um, work on theirs, and theirs was more of a study, laying a foundation as well. Dr. Cog already has, uh, has had a, a freight plan in the past, and so, um, but this highlighted shot here is what we want to focus on with you all moving forward, and what we'll do in the future is bring in Captain Hahn. Um, Captain Hahn is the commander of motor carrier safety at State Patrol, and he'll add perspective because we can talk about crash rates and we can talk about this map, but I'm going to tell you it, it's missing a ton of context, and if we don't bring in those folks, those professionals, um, it wouldn't even be a complete conversation. It's not Colfax. It's actually 7. So Colfax runs so close to 70 as we're building these heat maps, it just absorbs it. So I can't say Colfax doesn't have a high crash rate. I'm just going to say this, this map here, 
probably is too panned out and the, the thick line got too thick and just covered Colfax in it. So uh, Colfax, Colorado, um, all of those routes, they're, they're pretty major truck routes, to be honest, from a delivery standpoint. And so, yeah, you're going to have an ex- you know, a heightened uh, crash right there. Does anybody have a guess of what percentage truck traffic is for our stateway traffic? It's, you're not going to get it right. It's 8%. It's, <laughs> tru- <laughs> trucks are only 8%. Um, oh, and so, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have got it right if I didn't know. You know, uh, it, it, I would have said at least 20, right? But yeah. our traffic, only trucks are only 8% of our, tra- our traffic in the state. And so um, that, that to me is, is something that we lose perspective on even, you know, on a daily basis because they take up a lot of space there. You know, you see them. They're easy to see. Key, key slide that Erica talked about was the economic impact of Dr. Coggin. Two-thirds of the commodity flow is here. The number one freight route in Colorado is between here and Colorado Springs. And so that I-25 route through Monument, you know, the Monument Port of Entry, busiest port of entry in the state, weighs more trucks than any, any other facility in the state. Um, so that's key. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious, but at the same time, seeing the numbers, two-thirds is very impactful when you're just thinking about Dr. Cox. So we're leaving out Fort Collins. We're leaving out um, Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Just our metro is um, incredibly impactful to the state. And so freight planning here and freight numbers here will have the largest impact. And so um, that's why we, we're here and we want to help participate because we can have – uh, positive impacts. And the last thing I'll say is what Erica was talking about is um, something we find very important or have found very important. That timber structure repair program is actually a three-part program. We're doing it for concrete girded structures, steel girded structures, and timber structures. We just had a great opportunity to work on uh, timber structures. We're fixing 44 bridges for under $10 million. And so I go replace those, that's over 90 million. So it's a um, 30 year extension of life. And really one of the key reasons you do that is heavy haul trucking, oversized and overweight. My, my staff issues 65,000 of those permits a year and 20,000 of those are annual permits that can run every day. You know, that, that type of um, impact to our road can go a long way. So if you have a weight restricted structure, the detour route may be 40 miles, and we've seen them 140 miles. Um, At four miles per gallon, if I can bring that back to a direct path, that is a significant greenhouse gas reduction on a pretty large scale, 20,000 trips a year, 30,000 trips a year. Um, At four miles a gallon, we can be pretty impactful by just fixing our infrastructure. And obviously, if we fix our infrastructure for for the largest of the loads on the road, it fixes it for everybody. It makes it better for everybody. And then the secondary impact to that is that detour route that, that even if we don't tell trucks to take this detour, they'll find a detour through your, count, through your county roads or your city roads, your, your pavement's not ready for that. So you'll lay a 15-year pavement down and be talking about replacing it in an eight. That's because that detour had that impact. So if we just spend money on the initial investment on the bridge, uh, you know, bridge weight restriction, the first a pilot project I did for a concrete girder structure cost me 680000 and like I said, it's about 150000 a pop for these bridges um, that are timber structures just to add steel girders. And, and we, we care about things like environmental clearance, not removing any historical status of the structures. You know, there's, there's a lot of significance that come with our transportation system assets. And so we're covering all of our bases there and trying to really make an a, a impact that will hold true for the next 30 years. So that, that's... Uh, Hopefully what you guys will get out of the freight plan, we do have a couple, um, we have a 10 page version of this. If you want to read it at the extreme, like from space. And then we have a 52 page version of this. And then if you, um, that'll link you to our 350 page uh, version that really just shows all of our work. So um, with that, we're happy to uh, continue to come back and answer questions as needed. Um, But we will absolutely be participating in the Dr. Cog planning um, as well. Thank you. And Executive Director Rex had had a question. Thank you very much. Craig, good seeing you again. For those that don't know, Craig's a former Dr. Cog board member. Appreciate you, sir. And listen, he might talk that this is, uh, this is boring stuff, but he loves it. 
I don't, do. don't, <laughs> don't let him fool you. He's that's very... why I had Erica present, because I'd still be presenting. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And Erica, thank you. It's very nice to meet you as well. I had a question, and it was related to, um, you know, obviously comments that you've made regarding the the two-thirds com commodity flows. That's that's unbelievably striking to me. I think we maybe intuitively thought it was high, but yeah. two-thirds is amazing. Um, that 50 percent probably would have been a, a good estimate before going into a planning process. Yeah, like right. This, but mm -hmm. 66 is yeah. When you when you see it in numbers, right, it, it really striking. Uh, I wanted to relate that back to the to the bottlenecks, um, and I'm sure uh, the Transportation Commission is prioritizing those routes. But my question is: Is there is there discussion in the industry about you know time of day de delivery? I mean, do they try to avoid those like the plague? I mean, I know I would if I was a trucker, right? And I don't. I'm just curious, if, you know, if there's yeah. a conversation. Yeah, so I've had this conversation at lo lots of different regional perspectives, right? So let's go to I-70, just because I, everybody loves to talk about I-70 in my world. I think we have to approach this as a community. Um, we need to disincentivize Friday deliveries and incentivize Thursday deliveries or whatnot. When we do a, a traffic analysis on I-70, the only time truck traffic is higher than average and also combined with higher than average car traffic is Friday morning. So every other time there's lulls in traffic. And so why not? So what I'll tell you is both Eric and I, I've managed, you know, I started as a forklift driver and then was managing, you know, I had 290 drivers in my last job before I went to CDOT. And so we're trying to bring that perspective of managing, you know, to the government. So we're, we're working together at that, at that point. You give me that information when I was managing a terminal, I'd bring that right to my sales staff and say, hey, all of our customers on I-70, next time we're going into contracting, we're, we're going to be much higher if you ask us to serve, you know, provide service on a Friday than if you do on a Thursday. From the freight perspective, they don't make money if their wheels aren't turning. There's, that's the only way they make money. So congestion sucks. Um, when I was on the board for E470, we built a uh, reduced toll rate outside of peak hours. So we were incentivizing trucks to use E470 outside of the peak hours. That brings trucks off of I-25. And we also made it a hazmat route to keep hazmat trucks on that route since it's, you know, it's, it's a safe route. That is all to pull off of 70, 25, 225. So in the same way, we just need to change. Uh, I know Boulder has done some stuff at Pearl Street where they tried to do that. Uh, vail has done something like, stuff like that. But, you know, if you look at Vail, their delivery windows from like 8 to 12. That means you're leaving Commerce City at 6 in the morning. And so you're going to be right in the middle of traffic. We need to change the way that we're asking our deliveries to be made. Um, and the best way to look at that is look at McDonald's, say. They control 100% of their supply chain. You ever see a McDonald's truck making a delivery at 2 p.m. or right at lunchtime? No, they make it at 3 in the morning because they can be the most efficient then. They're not interacting with their customers in a negative way, and there's no traffic in their way. So they can get out there, make the delivery, come back, and go to bed before anybody wakes up. You know, And so um, I think that's where people, would, the trucking industry would prefer to be. But um, I'll tell you, one of my least favorite deliveries in my old job was going to the mall in Lone Tree because it was in the middle of the day. And I was going to, I'm sorry, I love no. you. I love you, Wynn. That's why I said it, though. But I'm just saying, like, if you're up in Commerce City, you got to drive to the mall to deliver T-shirts to Pacific Sunwear or something like that. Yeah. And it's going to take you two hours to get home. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, we've really set our, our minds on educating both the consumer and the business owner, as well as the trucking industry. Um, I have a spreadsheet if anybody wants it to, to show you <laughs> when E470 is a better business decision than taking I-25. Um, and we try to share that with folks to keep trucks off of I-25 to reduce congestion. And so, um, but yeah, if you're paying somebody overtime, it's way cheaper to take E470 than pay someone overtime on sitting traffic on I-25. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of perspective you can add just in this region, but um, part of that two-thirds, Doug, is that the trains come in here, um, they pass Grand Junction on their way, right? So they come, and then we run their stuff back to Grand Junction. We run stuff east. Grand Junction's not a large enough market for the train to stop. So, you know, they have this outdoor, um, like, athletic wear industry in Grand Junction. 
All that stuff goes from the L.A. port, comes to Denver, and then they drive it back up to Grand Junction because it's just not a big enough market. And so we have to understand just how impactful we, we are the place that all of the stuff all of Colorado's goods and services come to, and then we disperse them throughout the state. So Dr. Cog is important from that perspective, too. Thank you. And uh, Director Papstorf, did you have a question? A couple things. One, thank you so much for partnering with us on your work. I'm, I'm really excited about the foundation this will set for our regional freight plan to be able to work with you and other stakeholders and our regional partners to come up with some creative solutions to some of these really complex issues, right, and exploring different strategies that aren't just widening highways and adding more capacity, but you know, your comment about Grand Junction just sparked this thought. Yeah. Isn't there some way for the state or others to help incentivize or support or supplement the railroads to be able to make that stop to avoid back trucking those supplies, those materials from Denver back, right? Yeah, because the backhaul route's going back, coming back empty too. I mean, right. A, yeah. you're right. Um, here's, I mean, don't kill me if anybody from RTD is here. I've thrown this idea out several times, but um, you know, I've asked the question: Why doesn't small package that comes into the airport make the first two trains on the RTD A line at night? Make those package cars, deliver them to Union Station, deliver them on e-bikes. I mean, you have a ton. You, you, they, they, that would pay the RTD light bill at least. Um, because you, you could take your first two cars, make them package cars, the second two cars, passenger cars, and that doesn't just work in Denver. That works in L.A., that works in Seattle, that works in Chicago, that works in San Francisco. Um, so take that small package and reduce it and put it on your light rail. Um, about As long as they're the front two cars because of weight distribution, uh, the first, first two cars should be rail cars on a, on a light rail and then you can still move passengers alongside. And all that stuff would happen in the middle of the night. No one would even know. And that's when no one's riding light rail anyway. So um, there's a lot of good ideas. I actually talked to NASA about drone transport. <laughs> like they called me, I don't know, about drone transporting goods uh, up into the mountains. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, today ideas and future ideas that are thrown around all the time. Thank you. Are there other questions? Director Silverstein. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, one question: What is the definition of a of a truck? Is it anything that's not a passenger vehicle, or how to you know in the context of your presentation? Yeah, so that's a really good question because there's three definitions in law in Colorado. <laughs> so it's mostly revolving around gross vehicle weight rating: twenty six thousand, sixteen thousand, or ten thousand. Federal law uh, revolves around the 26,000 pound mark. State law revolves around the 16,000 pound mark, and some regulatory aspects revolve around a 10,000 pound mark. So 26,000 is what we're commonly referring to as a commercial motor vehicle. Um, there are buses that are over 26,000. Lots of buses that are over 26,000. They're hard to distinguish in traffic counts between those. Um, our modern technology does better, but our, our old technology will just classify them in the same way. Um, but when we're talking about trucks, from the data that we get, it's a 26,000-pound GBRW rating, a GBWR rating, and that's how the data comes back to us. But uh, there's complexity depending on context. <laughs> so when you talk about 8% um, of the, is that of the? Commercial motor vehicle, 26,000 and above. That's okay. the 8%. So it not, may not include, say, the neighborhood delivery vehicles. Or yeah. And, okay. and that's a, a huge point to point out, Michael, is that when we talk about data, Transcom, Atri, those are the, they're getting data from, from big companies that are willing to provide that data. 85% of the trucking industry has five units or less. So they're small one unit truck or one unit companies, 85%. Uh, I mean, there's 3 million trucks in, in the industry. And so 85% of those are part of a company that has five trucks or less. So it's a very small business driven. Um, and, and so that to me is the, the key mark to talk about is we can probably get 30, 40% of the industry covered in our data, but we're missing trash trucks, concrete trucks. They don't have the electronic onboard recorders because they're not necessary unless you go over 150 miles from your, from your home base every day. That's when the federal government requires you to put in that electronic onboard recorder for your logs, and that's how we get a bunch of data. And so 
your trash trucks, your concrete trucks, none of them go by a port of entry either. So we're not scaling them. You know, your only enforcement opportunity there is roadside with the law enforcement. So um, there's a lot of missing data. We can get better. And I think that's going to impact our ability to regionally and locally plan for for freight because we don't have that clear set data right now. It's just not available in the marketplace. We're, we're looking to solve that, though, but it's going to be a couple of years. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank we you very really much. We really appreciated this. And as now we have a quorum, we'll move back to the uh, approval of the meeting summary of uh, the RTC from Pe February 20th. Were there any changes? Hearing none, I look for a motion to approve these. So moved, Deborah Johnson. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. They are uh, approved as distributed. Thank you. Next business in order is our action item, community-based transportation planning, program selection recommendations with Nora Kern, program manager, uh, sub-area and project planning. Thank you, Nora. All right, thank you. Um, so today we are talking about uh, one of our new set-aside programs, the Community-Based Transportation Planning Program, and we do now have some project recommendations that we are hoping to approve. So quick recap, if you haven't seen the other presentations about this program, um, this is a set-aside program in the 2024 to 2027 Transportation Improvement Program. It was piloted or is currently being piloted as well. So we've had two pilot projects. The first was in Edgewater, um, and then we're just kicking off now a second pilot um, project with Westminster and Adams County. Um, so this program, it is kind of a technical assistance program. So for these projects, Dr. Cog is retaining the funding um, and then working closely with our member governments and local partners to work on transportation planning projects that focus on improving mobility for disproportionately impacted and historically marginalized communities. So for the set aside, um, which has kind of now been the formal version of the program, there is two and a half million dollars um, in the tip. Um, and we are planning on splitting that into two two year cycles. So roughly one and a quarter million dollars for each two year cycle. And so we're talking now about the, that first half of the money in the first two-year cycle for the program. So a little bit about our selection process. Um, so we did have a call for letters of interest um, at the end of last year. It was two months, uh, particularly since it was over the holidays. Um, we had a, a good response um, to that window, which I'll show you in a second. Um, we then had a, a selection panel that reviewed all of the um, letters of interest letters of interest um, and scored each of them. So that panel included a number of Dr. Cog staff, both on our transportation planning side, as well as our regional planning side um, and our engagement um, team. And then we had uh, Chris Quinn from RTD and Marsha Nelson from CDOT as well. So you can see listed um, the six evaluation factors that were reviewed for each of the um, different projects. So here is a list. We had 10 letters of interest, which we were really happy with since this is kind of the first time we've had this um, new program. Um, the letters of interest had an estimated budget um, for each project, and it was about two and a half million. So we were about double of what we think we have available. Um, so after the review of the selection committee, we are recommending five of the 10 projects, which you can see kind of highlighted, or they're not grayed out at the top of the screen. Um, one thing to note is because this program is a technical assistance program, um, at this phase, we only have letters of interest from our member governments and from the one nonprofit who submitted the letters of interest. We don't have a fully fleshed out scope yet. So the, the budget recommendation is really a draft. Um, the staff will be working with each of the project um, nominators to figure out exactly what it is we want to do, what's going to be required to do that. And so those numbers will be finalized before we go to procurement, of course. Um, so with that, um, you can see the scores there on the right if you're curious. Um, I do have a recommended motion, but I'd also be happy to take any questions about the program or about the selection if there are any. 
Thank you so much. Are there questions for Nora? Hearing none, I look for a motion. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Ron. Sorry, I was waiting to see if there were any questions, but I did one. <laughs> thank, Nora, thank you so much for your work on this um, really important program. And I, I just want to take a moment to, to thank CDOT for their partnership in this. Um, one of the ways that we're able to pursue this TIP set-aside program and continue this, this work, um, along with a few of our other TIP set-asides, is um, CDOT's agreement to allow us to tap into state toll credits to provide the match. So some people might ask, well, why is Dr. Cog doing this work? Why aren't local communities doing this work? And they will very much be partners in these efforts, but we are able to sort of extend some efficiencies by us coordinating the work, us managing contracts and being able to tap into the, toll, the state toll credits to provide the local match and avoid having each individual recipient of, a, of an individual grant try to come up with local match, manage a consultant, do all, that, do all that work. So I wanted to thank the partners around the table and just speak a little bit to kind of why we're pursuing these set-aside programs this way. And thank you for that explanation. I think that's very helpful as well. Anyone up for making a motion this morning? Thank you, Director Holguin, and is there a second? Thank you. Uh, those in favor of uh, recommending to the Board of Directors funding five community-based planning projects through the first two years of the community-based planning program set aside is recommended by the Selection Committee, say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we will skip back down to the second discussion item, uh, regional housing needs assessment, which is attachment D in your packet. Chris Valdez will be presenting for us this morning. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and attention today. Um, I do have Andy here. He is going to help me. I am still kind of relatively new to Dr. Cog. So if any questions come up, um, Andy's here to answer those. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Valdez. I'm a program manager to provide leadership to the regional planning team here at Dr. Cog. First of all, I want to talk about MetroVision. And before we get started about the regional housing needs assessment, MetroVision, as many of you know, is our regional plan. This version was unanimously adopted by Dr. Cog Board in 2017. It lays out the desired outcomes for the region related to growth and development, mobility, the environment, livability, and economic vitality. However, it does not replace local plans. Rather, implementation follows a collective impact approach, recognizing that actions and efforts at a local level at, and among different local and regional partners what it will be to help make progress towards these desired outcomes as outlined in the Metro Vision. And housing is a part of Metro Vision. With a focus on housing options, with the objective to diversify housing stock, supply more affordable housing, attainable housing, and find more opportunities for this diverse and attainable housing with great access to our region's multimodal transportation network. And as some of you know, Dr. Cog has multiple roles, and each one of those covers a slightly different geography, with our largest being the Regional Planning Commission. Our roles all fit within our mission as an organization of local governments, which is establishing guidelines, setting policy, and allocating funding in three different areas, transportation and personal mobility, growth and development, and aging and disability resources. Housing is directly connected to Dr. Cog's role as a metropolitan planning organization. We're responsible for federally required metropolitan or regional transportation planning processes. Congress even went so far as to clarify that this transportation planning process must consider housing when they last updated this section of the code. Last time the planning division was here on the topic of housing, we were working on adding a housing transportation coordination activity to our unified planning work program. Partly in response to this and other language added by Congress to strengthen this connection between housing and Dr. Cog's transportation planning work. That work plan actively 
partially covers this housing assessment work we're about to get into. So the housing needs assessment is just the first cog in this broader housing strategy and planning work. The assessment is broken up into two phases, which we are doing right now. Phase one focuses on analyzing the housing need and phase two is focused on barriers and some initial transitions into the strategy work. The ultimate goal is to see housing reflected in future plan updates at Dr. Cog. We know there's a lot of great assessment work already underway in local jurisdictions. Consolidated planning, for example, is key to maintaining access for many communities to federal housing funding. The key differences are, are the purpose and the scale of this housing plan. Scale in terms of geography, looking across the entire region, because individuals' housing location decisions do cross jurisdictional boundaries and do directly affect the everyday travel options and distances involved for households. And also look at scale in terms of time horizon. Most people are looking out with 10 to 20 years in the future or more. This is looking out 50 years, with the opportunity, or out to 2050, with the opportunity to draw on our other forecasting work we do as part of the transportation planning process. In terms of step, steps we start with understanding the different components of need. What are those current needs as well as needs for forecasted household growth? We then work to understand that need across different income levels. And we also are working to determine that across different regional submarkets, and even eventually showing what might, what might look like at a local level if the region were meet, to meet this overall housing need. So we have some components of the comprehensive housing needs. The project team's methodology accounts for current need in two buckets, under production through analysis of changes in household formation over time and accounting for homeless families that would not be found in many foundational data sets we've relied on in household forecasting work like the census. But rather than stop with this shortage, the methodology also looks at making up for this current need with what it would take to keep up with a projected need related to growth. Project teams split the region, region up into five different submarkets. The goal was for these to be contiguous, to reflect some commute patterns using a cluster algorithm to try and capture as high a number of commute origins and destinations in one submarket as possible, and to be able to leverage data products from the Census Bureau that allow for lots of custom tabula tabulation to understand the different submarkets. If you can't quite tell where your community is in the map, they're listed here. Unfortunately, some jurisdictions do cross into multiple submarkets, but for some it may just be a small sliver with limited number of households. Those are identified by the communities with the star next to them. We've got a series of slides that will show how these submarkets differ based on the recent and current data. So not looking forward just quite yet. Housing tenure just means how many own their housing versus how many are renting their housing. We've got a significant number of renters in all submarkets, despite the majority of households that own their home. As we're all probably aware, average sale prices differ between the submarkets, with the high seen in the more mountainous west submarket, but also high in the north. You'll also notice some parity between Central and Southeast, but also note that all have followed very similar trends over the last two decades. Now we're gonna look at rental price trends. Things are a little, little closer on rents, though that difference between 1500 and 1900 is quite significant for a household over a full year, approximately $4,800. Cost burdening is when a household spends 30% or more of their household income on housing. Severe burden is when that percentage goes over half of the household income. This is something that many housing needs assessments look, look at to try and understand how many households may not be finding housing that's attainable or sustain, sustainable at their income level. While there is variation, nearly half or more of the households who rent are experiencing this cost burden. So now let's go back to the region as a whole and look forward. Based on our work so far, the regional housing needed by 2035 is 216,000 homes. That's in addition to existing housing supply. 
That factors in current shortfalls in terms of underproduction and homelessness, as well as forecast household growth over that same time period. By 2050, that need will be over half a million. So let's break down that over half a million number. We're looking by income. So that's accounting for household income as it relates to area median income, forecasting demand in those different income groups as compared to the supply affordable at price points that would keep those households from being cost burdened. The biggest cap gap in forecast is that zero to 60% area median income between supply in the shaded area and the demand being shown in the outline. So here's where we are in terms of schedule for the overall regional housing needs assessment. The first piece of the work has included this analysis as well as initial stakeholder engagement. The project team is working on a summary that will finalize and wrap up this analysis. And then we're processing or proceeding into more stakeholder engagement in this upcoming phase. We actually have one meeting this afternoon. And so phase two, we're gonna be looking at barriers and potential strategies. In this phase, we're working to explore systematic barriers to sufficient housing construction and initial or potential strategies to overcome those barriers. Both of these are to meet the needs identified in the analysis phase. And we're aiming to bring all these findings together by the end of June. So I just wanna thank you for your time today. And I'd be happy to turn it over to the chair or open it for any questions. Thank you, Chris, and Andy as well. <laughs> um, and I understand there's a question from Director Adams. I, I don't know if it's a question as much as it is a, a comment. First of all, thank you for, uh, you know, for providing this data. And, and I do think this is a problem universally in most of the major cities in the country. I, I just came back from Atlanta and I, I talked to friends there and I'm amazed, and this is mostly a comment regarding rental income, and it's in that bottom group that you're, you know, you, you show on your chart, that zero to 60 group, because I think that group in the last, maybe it's 12 months, it's 24 months, it's 36 months, I've talked to people who are uh, owners of rental property, and I'm amazed. They tell me they the rents have doubled for some of those people in those groups. And these are probably our most vulnerable groups. I'm not sure I know what the answer is, but I applaud, I applaud the idea that we're actually taking a, a look at some strategies because I don't envision them leaving out of the inner cities and going to the suburbs, which is probably worse in terms of pricing for them. But, uh, but I do think we have to solve this problem because it is, it is getting worse. And, you know, a friend of mine in Atlanta told me, you know, for his rental units, he actually can, if he had half the units he had two years ago, he would make more profit on his rental income than he made, would have made two years ago. That, that's, that's how bad the situation, and your numbers actually, I was actually surprised. I thought they would be higher in terms of the average rents. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yes. Director Clark. Sorry, I was turning this way, but I need to. I know. Pardon me. <laughs> That's the tough part. There we go. Hi. Um, so I apologize to the room in advance because I have a series of questions, but being a planner and an affordable housing developer, thoughts and, and questions. Um, so uh, first of all, I too am very excited, you know, when there are really comprehensive planning efforts that, um, especially on a regional level, because affordable housing is so critical um, across jurisdictional boundaries. Those are these political lines we put on maps, but that doesn't speak to how people live in terms of where they work and where they, uh, where they actually live. Um, and so... I think this is really important. So I just have a few questions about, um, so one is kind of some of the definitions. So um, 
we often use terms affordable, kind of big A affordable, little A affordable, attainable housing. I'm curious about kind of the consistency of the use of those terms and kind of how is that being defined in the engagement that you all are doing in terms of what is being deemed affordable, what's being deemed attainable? I would say they're being used interchangeably um, because we have affordable and attainable and they're kind of one and the same. What's affordable to one group, it's attainable to another group. So we're, we don't necessarily have a big A and a little A. But. So I would just, uh, yeah, I wanna hear. I think the AMI levels we're looking at are what we're really focused on. Um, so that so that's related back to the area median income, and we've synced up with um, a lot of the definitions that are currently um, being used, also for the, the the work being put in place under Proposition One Two Three. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've settled on um, that zero to thirty percent, and that thirty percent to sixty percent, so that we could be consistent with a lot of the commitments that local governments are already making in that area. So yeah, I think that's fair. I think um, I would maybe ask you to think about the use of those terms um, because as people are engaged in a lot of affordable housing conversations, um, including members of the public, um, we tend to look at affordable housing as that that has that is subsidized housing. Um, it's really a lot of folks in the market rate housing community that are speaking to attainable housing, just trying to bring the you know, the rent levels down, but there's not a government subsidy as a part of that. So a lot of people that you're talking to will understand it or hear it that way. Um, I too regularly argue, I'm just, affordable housing is everything. It's, everything's relative as to what is affordable to you versus what is affordable to someone else. So even if you pick just one of those terms and use that consistently, I just think as long as to a lot of us, they're actually not interchangeable in that way, and so it's just important to kind of nail down what is the intention there um, so that it's, it's clearly understood by, by those that you're engaging with. Um, the other piece is about the community engagement. Um, obviously, you know, this is a regional group. There are jurisdictions that are having a lot of meetings as well, talking a lot about housing, so I'm always curious about the layering of engagement. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of individuals who really are into housing will go to all of the different types of meetings that are provided, but it can be confusing to some to understand kind of here's how housing is being done by this group on this regional level, and here's what's being done with my city, and just, and people get um, meeting fatigue. So I'm curious about kind of is there a level of interface with some local jurisdictions about getting people out and not overwhelming them with kind of similar questions that they may be getting from different groups at the same time. Yeah, so right now our engagement is focusing on local governments, finance professionals, um, people in the housing industry, developers, multifamily developers, private developers, public developers. And then once we get into the strategy portion, then we will go more out into the general public. So right now we're looking kind of for those interested stakeholders and like the one this afternoon is going to be with finance professionals who fund affordable housing or and private developers to talk about how, because we can't stop developing from that 120% AMI and up. We need to continue to develop that housing stock as well. But what are the barriers they're experiencing to getting these projects out of the ground? So as far as like, I, under, I can totally understand meeting fatigue and question fatigue and survey fatigue. And we really want to be intentional with how we're reaching out to people. So as part of this first phase, we purposely did not go out to the public. We didn't put it on our website. We didn't do things like that because we wanted to have our advisory group and then our stakeholder groups. And then kind of when we were ready to get input from the community, then we did that. Thank you, I think that's, that's awesome, really appreciate that. Two more things. Um, one is in the rental rates, when we talk about cost burden households, um, is, are these figures looking just at the, the base rent rate itself? Um, and I ask that just for 
you know, sometimes we're talking about things are not affordable because of here's what your rent is, but obviously there's other costs related to that, and particularly for this group in terms of the transportation costs. Like what, just wondering how, if at all, kind of this data can be married at some point with where people live, what some of those additional costs are, because the cost burden is probably even greater than what we're seeing here because of where they're forced to live just um, for affordability purposes. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's some, some important feedback that we've been getting. Um, the data that we're relying on is um, uh, disaggregate data from the American Community Survey. Um, and so it's really helpful, but it doesn't, that survey doesn't capture things like transportation costs. So how can we bring that, that information and insight in about different locations uh, when, when right now we're look, looking at like the sub-regional levels or the regional sub-market levels. So that's, I think, um, uh, a, something we're going to have to try and figure out as we move this work forward and integrate it with our transportation planning work. Awesome. And my final question, but it's more thorny, so don't have to dig into it fully here because I've taken up entirely too much time and I apologize. Um, there is, of course, at the legislature now, HB 1313, uh, Housing and Transit-Oriented Communities um, on the House side. Um, you know, not sure if it would go through it all, but want to understand that type of thing where it's, um, it's proposed legislation that would impact local communities within metropolitan planning <laughs> uh, organization boundaries that would um, have local jurisdictions providing housing goals, um, and and this would be placed as proposed within the Department of Local Affairs. So curious about, again, kind of that relationship of not having duplicate efforts happening, but all of this information helping local jurisdictions to make strong, important decisions about locating housing, proximate to transit, density goals, what are the housing needs? Um, so yeah, just wondering if, if staff here are kind of tracking that in any way as well. But I, we're, we're definitely tracking that and some of the other um, housing legislation, and that's something that, that our board is, is um, looking at when they take positions on, on monitoring um, different bills. And so that is something that we're keeping track of, even just talking with uh, staff at uh, the Department of Local Affairs, talking with the State Demography Office about um, some, some of the proposed uh, new work for them as well and just how this work could integrate, um, trying to integrate on, on messaging. But I think when we get to the strategy portion, I think that's when um, things like uh, some, of, some of these bills like 1313 um, are, are important to come up in, in this discussion, but also that there are other strategies that lots of communities um, are looking at and already taking on. And so, um, yeah, it is definitely something we're following. And thank you. Those are great, insightful questions. I I particularly like the one that connects uh, the the transit to um, the the housing cost and tries to couple them as you know maybe no more than forty percent or something like that. That could be a very interesting figure because you might live centrally where rents rents are low. Um, and your transit cost, you know, based on kids who have dance lessons might be very high, um, you know, for Uber or whatever. And, um, and you might live somewhere else that's near a transit line that although, uh, you know, your, your uh, rent might be higher, some of the other costs might be lower. So, um, it's a, an interesting perspective. I appreciated that very much. I would indulge me for a moment on 1313. I think um, one of the things that we do so well here at Dr. Cog is um, do studies, present best practices, and allow local jurisdictions to make their own decisions. And so, um, uh, although we might, as a community, select 
certain facets uh, in certain areas of our city that come from 1313. I think as local governments were generally not in favor of an overlay that doesn't let us make decisions for our own communities. So you may see something that looks like um, an angry mob <laughs> against certain legislation, but it doesn't mean that we don't share um, the, the ultimate goal of trying to make housing and transit uh, convenient and affordable for everyone. So just opportunity. Are there other questions that we have for Chris or Andy? Yes, Director Broom. Sure, exactly how to turn this on. You got it. You had it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any uh, numbers available about the demand for? Oh, you build a condo into the condo and that rental property. Or condos two. into the mix because that's going to help uh, ice wise for everybody up and down the line. That's definitely something we've heard as we've discussed the barriers with different stakeholder groups, um, that, that that is a, a missing piece in um, the housing market for people to move up through the wealth building opportunities, but also for the opportunities that creates for other folks coming in uh, to the market behind them in terms of, of new house formation the like. So it is definitely something we've been hearing. I don't know that we have numbers on it directly. It is hard to measure things like that where there is that latent demand um, that's out there. But um, I, I think uh, that is something that um, our, our, uh, as we compare to different markets across the country, it is something that is a missing piece. And I guess finally, uh, looked at where all the water is going to come from, all of these additional units. Um, wa water is one of those things that um, does come up with this um, when, when folks are, are asking about how can we accommodate growth in general, not just related to housing. Um, it is a, a discussion about trade-offs in different scenarios, um, but there are a lot of things that communities are doing uh, to increase efficiency. In efficiency. Um, there's a lot of opportunities, and so um, that is something that uh, is factored into a lot of folks' growth already, and it's just a matter of trade-offs and in, in what uh, that water is allocated towards. Well, I would invite you to ride RTD. You know, maybe you can get by with one car and big difference in your, old, you know, budget. I will also add one of our focus groups is infrastructure, including water providers. So having that conversation with them as well. And power, <laughs> Director Adams. One quick uh, comment. Your comment your, uh, about uh, condos just caused me to just think about the banking community and financing. So I assume they're part of your focus group, that you're spending good time with them. And the concern I have there, obviously, is with rising rates. Everything I'm reading these days suggests that it's creating a really big burden on home ownership, both at the, you know, residential level and obviously with condos. And so we, we need, and I've sat on in my lifetime, sat on some, uh, you know, I've sat on some bank boards and sometimes in spite of how they sound, that's not really the spirit underlying it all in terms of their willingness to actually engage here and make a difference with their capability and capacity. So I, I always tend to think they could do more in order to address more of this if they chose to do it. But, but you know, if you've got them engaged, that's about all you can do. And hopefully they recognize that it is a collective problem, that if we solve some of the housing problems for all groups, everybody benefits. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Director Cook. Now, uh, since you're meeting with the finance folks today, I wondered if um, talking about current leg legislation, the, the 
effort to eliminate parking minimums. Um, I, in my nonprofit, was recently involved in the development of an affordable housing complex near transit, near, near a train station, um, and uh, it's underwritten. It was uh, made possible by tax credits from CHAPA, and um, we got pushback from the investors in a critical part of the development because they were concerned that the parking ratio of one-to-one, -one, given that it was shared parking, wouldn't be sufficient and that uh, we wouldn't be able to fill the complex. So I'll be interested if you have feedback from them or can assuage their concerns on that. I will tell you that it's about full right now. And uh, of the 54 spaces, about 25 maybe are going unused. So. Thank you. Other questions? I will just say I'm right now reading a book called Paved Paradise and How Parking Has Shaped the World. Excellent book. But yeah, right in that vein of how we <laughs> can't get financing for housing because of parking. Very good. And uh, power as well, electric, gas, whatever. There, there are considerations. I had heard something from Xcel Energy that uh, if our growth projections for housing increases exceed 2 to 3 percent that they figure, that we should let them know because they have to get approval from the PUC to build these um, big, uh, gosh, I can't power think, plants. well, pa not power plants per se, but even the substations, the infrastructure for that and some of the lead time in that is five years. So uh, there's there's a lot of moving parts that um, are important when we're considering changes to the uh, rate of housing. And thank you for writing that down, Andy. <laughs> we definitely heard about it at our infrastructure focus group. Um, I think there's there's lots of um, attention being put on the grid right now with a lot of the other uh, push to, to from gas to electric. And so they're kind of feeling pinched by both growth and by some of these extra demands on the network as we switch to electric vehicles, as we're being asked to switch our appliances, and that's being incentivized at the same time. And so uh, there, there was just lots of concern of like, how do we make our network, our, our network for, for delivering power more robust? And so we definitely heard that straight from some providers. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? This was great. Thank you, guys. Definitely appreciate that. Uh, we are down to our administrative items and uh, member comments. Uh, CDOT is first. Who would like to begin? You can take a stab at it and then hand it over to Commissioner Adams, Commissioner Cook. Um, we have our workshops tomorrow, starting tomorrow, and we have our, our monthly meeting on Thursday. Um, for this month, we have, a, as always, a packed agenda. Um, we're going to get an update on the uh, employee housing effort that, that CDOT has led to, to increase the, um, to decrease vacancy rates, and um, really excited about that. Spoiler alert, it's helping, as we might imagine. Um, uh, we're also going to have an overview, uh, the environmental justice, uh, uh, Marsha Nelson will provide an overview um, to continue to onboard the new commissioners and help them understand the, uh, the, the broad scope of environmental justice and, um, at CDOT. Uh, we'll have an update on mobility committee. Um, as I mentioned last month, we're doing a, a deep dive on uh, electric vehicle presentations. So if anybody's interested, tune in at around 2 o'clock p.m where we'll get a, a, an overview of electric vehicles in Colorado. Uh, uh, freight mobility, as we discussed today, um, and I think that I mean, the, uh, quite a few uh, proposed resolutions, but um, perhaps the most important is the uh, approval and adoption of the FY2425 final annual budget allocation plan, so we can submit it to the governors by April 15th at the deadline. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that, hand it over. You did an excellent job, so thank you. The only thing I'd add is that uh, we have the 1601 uh, interchange approval 
up I-76 that would allow BNSF to re relocate its intermodal facility from the north part of Denver up into the Weld County area. So just apropos as to our earlier discussion on freight movements, it, it'll make a big impact. I Thank you. Next up is RTD. I'll yield the floor. <laughs> I'll yield the floor to Director Geisinger to comment. I'll just say, make two comments and then turn it back to uh, to Deborah Johnson. The um, uh, two things that we're we're addressing in the uh, sort of government relations world. One is is uh, looming big. We are going to lose our Tabor waiver for the six tenths of a cent base tax. We have a one cent tax. Four tenths is fast tracks. Six tenths is is our base, the original tax, and uh, we'll start probably having to return money. Um, after our, after we pay off our bonds and for that base in uh, November of this year, so we are considering going to the ballot for a debrucing. We are, we are not we have not done that yet, but stay tuned. It could um, it could cost the agency uh, looking at what it's costing other counties like Jefferson and El Paso. It could it could cost the agency 45 to 60 or 70 million dollars a year. So it's a significant. Um, we are looking at the other thing is that, um, that we have our bill with um, the bill with zero fares for better air and zero fares for youth. It is going through the legislature. They're fighting for a very small amount of money, as I'm sure you all know. So we're uh, we're working on that and hope to um, to retain those those funds and get those additional funds. Thanks. Thank you. Director Johnson. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Director Geisinger, for your report. Uh, just a couple of elements I'd like to touch upon and provide some context for that. Uh, recognizing that RTD does have a strategic plan in which we have four strategic priorities uh, that consist of community value, uh, customer excellence, employee ownership, and um, financial success. Uh, the people that comprise RTD from a staff level, we have been working collectively and cooperatively um, with a laser like focus on three initiatives that spawn from our strategic priorities, which is back to basics, people power, and a welcoming transit environment. So, with that as a backdrop, one important element in which we have collectively been working on. Um, is crime prevention through environmental design, recognizing that public transportation, specifically RTD services, are interwoven into the fabrics of the communities that we serve, and recognizing, as we saw with the adverse impacts of COVID, um, that individuals will seek refuge in public rights away. And that impacts one's um, journey experience when utilizing public transport. So with that as a backdrop, um, I'm pleased to announce that uh, we commenced on Sunday an elevator pilot program. It's three key um, stations on our light rail uh, network. It's uh, Nine Mile Station, which serves the H and R lines, Colorado, which serves E and H, and Southmore, that serves E and H. And it's a 90-day pilot. And basically what we're doing, recognizing that people have utilized our elevators for other purposes than they were designed for, um, that the doors will be resting in a default open status. And so somebody who's intended to use the elevator for the purpose in which it designed, they need to press that button button. Therefore, uh, chances are you won't have individuals that are sleeping or doing other unwanted activities in those elevators. Uh, we basically have threshold guidelines to determine what success will look like, recognizing those three elevators that I just um, specified have the largest comments that we receive. Um, collectively, we probably receive like 350 elevators, just 350 comments relative to activities in those elevators over the past couple of months. Then another element I'm proud to announce, um, I actually personally got a call from somebody from the White House as we talk about how public transit can help save lives in reference to those to the point that I made earlier that are seeking refuge in reference to our transit network. Uh, the White House has a challenge to save lives from overdose and RTD is proud to join MBTA, which is the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, which is in Metropolitan Boston, uh, BART, San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District in Oakland, California, that services uh, the San Francisco Oakland area, WMATA, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, as um, we basically have our sworn post-certified law enforcement uh, members that can administer Narcan in addition to our um, supplemental security forces that is a private entity. Uh, just some stats here. Um, in 2023, 
our men and women in blue administered 103 uh, successful uh, Narcan doses that help reverse uh, people on the verge of losing their lives. And as of March 6, there have been 22 thus far. And then the last thing I'd like to share, um, on March 28th, um, RTD is having a career fair at the Crown Plaza Denver Airport uh, Convention Center, I-70 in Chambers. It was scheduled for last Thursday, but recognizing that there was this little powdery <laughs> stuff that happened, uh, we rescheduled that. And one thing that we are going to do is basically um, offer conditional um, letters of employment based upon uh, some uh, federal DOT drug testing and things alike, but we want to ensure that we get people into our pipeline. And then last but not least, in the event you did not know, yesterday, March 18th, was National Transit Employee Appreciation Day. Um, this has been going on for some time and has grown somewhat, and uh, we're in the midst of acknowledging all of our individuals that do uh, great work in moving this region. And um, a little factoid, like it was 400 years ago, almost to the day, that the first public transit agency uh, commenced with service delivery in Paris, France. So there you have it. You can use it at a cocktail party. You don't have to tell them I told you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and for the rack, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hard to follow that one. Um, yeah. I don't have any trivia um, tips for, for the cocktail party. Um, just two items. Um, rack is... Uh, uh, sponsoring a, a bill, House Bill 1341, that is to um, uh, eliminate or, or um, allow local governments to enact stricter anti-idling ordinances for, for vehicles, especially in the um, in large truck category. And so um, we are, um, our first hearing is tomorrow. Actually, it was canceled out on the snow day last Thursday. And so if there is opportunity um, to uh, uh, lend uh, lend support to to this bill. It's it doesn't require anyone to do anything, but it allows local governments to exceed a um, a, a state uh, threshold that's been in statute for about 15 years. And the 1341 House Bill 1341, and the. Um, the trucking industry is, is supportive of, of our effort. Um, they were the ones who put this um, prohibition in place uh, about 10 years ago for other reasons. And so we've worked out some, some issues on from, from a safety perspective for the, for the truckers that are, say, sleeping in their, in their cabs or in their sleeping compartments at, at truck stops. So that that's still would remain in place. And then um, we are uh, hopefully in consideration, there's always a competition for funding in the legislature, as we all know, and uh, hopefully the legislature will find um, small um, dollars for RAC to uh, continue our lawn and garden electrification efforts, our incentive programs. And so we're um, hopefully uh, will be uh, what they call um, sprinkles in the Joint Budget Committee, and there'll be sprinkles for, for our program, and uh, we hope those, uh, those make it. We'll, we'll see how March goes. But um, that's, that's all we have uh, to report out today. Thank you so much. The chair would like to thank uh, Mayor Mills for being here today and joining us. We're so glad to have you as part of Dr. Cog. Thank you. Our next meeting is April 16th. And if there are no, oh, yes, parking tickets, do come see Cam. He is <laughs> the guy with the goods. Um, if there's no uh, other uh, matters by members, we are adjourned.